Hello and welcome to the Petticoated Swashbuckler. My name is Marin and today we're doing one of my favourite things. We are making more headwear. I've come to the point in my my Tudor outfit, my beautiful, beautiful Tudor dress here, uh, where I need to think about headwear. And for the nine, the sorry, not the nineteen thirties. Well, there were lots of different headwear for the nineteen thirties as well, but that's beside the point. For the fifteen thirties, however, there's a lot of different kinds of headwear that you can use. Um, people wore hats uh, or hoods or veils or coifs. This is an example of a coif, or sometimes it's pronounced coif. Um, just sort of simple white little bonnety thing um, and I'm going to make the famous French hood which is so popular and so kind of modern and new and raunchy and exciting um, it has a very kind of rounded shape it looks very rounded on the head and that's in contrast to the other kind of big popular hood in the period which was called the English hood or the gable hood which is much more sort of rectangular on your head like a diamond shape almost. You can see the beginnings of what will become the French hood if you look at uh, paintings from the continent from the early 1500s. Uh, there are some of Anne of Brittany, for example, um, and showing these very, very rounded headpieces with like a veil or a kind of bag thing in the back. Um, a lot of... <sighs> a lot of places will tell you that the French hood came to England with Anne Boleyn, who of course I've stolen the necklace of. Um, that's probably not true. She came from France in 1522 and the only reason why I remember that date is uh, the musical Six. Uh, 1522 came straight to the UK. Uh, which, you know, you shouldn't, you, historical fiction can be very important to understand history. Anyway, um, she she came from the French court. French became very fashionable. She was became very fashionable, but she's not the first. Uh, Mary Tudor, uh, Henry VIII's sister, is shown wearing what looks like a French hood uh, in her wedding in 1516, and in 1520, two years before Anne came from France, Catherine of Aragon, her kind of predecessor. Um, gifted a French hood to her daughter, Mary, Princess Mary. Uh, so they absolutely existed in Britain before that, but it kind of took off in the 1520s and 1530s. Um, they were, and they were thought of enough as a sort of Anne thing for um, Jane Seymour when she took over after Anne had been beheaded to kind of forbid the wearing of French hoods among her ladies-in-waiting. Uh, there's at least one lady-in-waiting who came to serve... Jane Seymour and was told that you can come back when you have something proper to wear and not that horrible French hood thing. Um, so it was definitely something pe people looked at it and thought, you know, that's, that's French and raunchy and a little bit too much Anne Boleyn perhaps. And it was very popular. It was popular at court. It was a favourite of um, Anne of Cleves, who was the, of course, the fourth wife of Henry VIII. Um, she came from Germany um, and was wearing a very German style of clothing when she arrived, but she very quickly kind of turned to English fashions and the French had became a favourite um, type of headwear for her. It's, uh, it's to show off bling. I mean, it's to it's, it serves several purposes. It serves to cover the head and most of the hair, um, but it also serves to show off wealth and you can do that by piling bling onto it. I mean, you can bling the bling. Uh, you can trim it and then you can bling the trim and then you can trim the bling and it's, you just can't get enough. And it's actually, this became enough of a problem for Henry VIII to actually in, introduce legislation, uh, laws, sanctuary laws, stating that women weren't allowed to wear fancy jewellery on their French hoods unless their husband owned at least one horse. So I don't know, Henry was maybe worried that women were spending all their husband's money on jewellery and, and nothing was left for the horse. I don't know, but I found that interesting. Um, it's, a, it's not the headband. Like, if you've seen a lot of 
movies. Um, we're looking at you, the other Berlin girl. Um, you can see French hoods being worn almost like headbands. Um, you're sort of like this, and then nothing's covered back, and nothing's covered in the front. That's not the point. Nor are they like a visor. You know, you do not want to look like that dinosaur from Jurassic Park. Um, they are worn over hair that is braided, and not even just like mine is now, but braided and kind of put up into a big braided bun-like thing on top of the head. And then you would wear your quaff. Like so. And then you would wear your French hood on top of that. So only a little bit of hair in the front is, is shown. The rest of the hair is covered. Uh, the only hair that you can see is this bit here. Your kind of fringe or your forehair. Uh, and that was considered quite risky as well because the gable hood, the more English hood, covered everything. And you would just have like this part of your face would be visible. I keep looking at the viewfinder to make sure I'm, I'm, this is kind of making sense. But the French hood would show just a little bit of the hair and you could kind of pull a little hair forward and give yourself a little oomph. And that was considered, you know, a little bit risque. The French hood is made up of several parts. It's made up of a coif, um, or coif, uh, up until like 1520, well, actually later, 1540. You do see pictures of people wearing red coifs underneath their French hoods, but after like 1540, white linen is like the way to go and white linen stays the most important kind of color and quality for hoods and coifs and hats and caps for centuries um it would be it could be tied under the neck or it could be just pinned in place uh, when i do my hair properly and like braid it up with ribbons and stitch it to my head um it sounds very dramatic i'll show you in a later video um you kind of uh, it, you don't need the, the tying underneath the chin to keep it on. Uh, a couple of pins kind of through the fabric and through your braids and up again will do that. Um, then you need the paste. And the paste is kind of the brim and the crescent, the, the stiff bits that make up the bits that you think of that look a little bit like a hellband, you know? Uh, they're usually quite stiff, made from buckram. Um, and covered in beautiful, beautiful fabrics. And of course, this is somewhere you'd really want to show off your beautiful fabrics because you only need a tiny bit. So you can make a, a little bit of fancy fabric and go, do a big impression. Um, you, we, people aren't quite sure where the name comes from. Uh, it might have been from the paste that you used to stiffen the buckram. It could also come from the French uh, passé, which means border because it's just a lot of borders with bordered with stuff. So that could be it. We don't know, but that's kind of the main bit. But you do also need a veil because it's called a hood. It is a hood. You need to cover the back of the head as well. And the veil does that. It's attached to the paste and it covers the hair. It's like a bag in the back. Um, and uh, it's usually made, it's usually black in the pictures. Uh, it's often made from silk velvet or silk satin. I'm gonna make mine from the silk velvet because I had a little bit left, just enough. Um, and the paste, I'm gonna make the one bit out of a black um, taffeta. And then the white bit, I'm gonna make of like a rest of the white satin that we embroidered for the four part of the four sleeves. Um, and then of course, on top of all of this, you have what's called bilaments. Well, sometimes it has several names. Um, depending on whether you're English or French or Scottish, actually. But I'm going to go with the, the English version, so that's called bilaments. Uh, and the bilaments are the, the bling. Uh, sometimes you would have separate kind of pieces of buckram wired and covered in fancy fabric and then bejeweled. And then you could kind of remove it from one hood and put it on another. And you could put, or you could have different sort of strips of jewellery and you could change which one you wanted to wear depending on what dress you wanted to wear um sometimes the stitch to the hood i think i'm going to do one strip stitch to the hood and then maybe try and make another one separate but we'll see i do have some pearls like the ones 
that we used on the faux part and the faux sleeve. I do have some more of these outers that we used in the faux sleeves, which I think will look very nice. So I think that's what we'll go with. And of course, there are some strange bits. Like, there are no extant French hoods, as far as I know. So the only things we know about them are the things that we can kind of glean from uh, household accounts, portraits, and experimentation, frankly. And I'm using the um, Tudor Taylor book uh, a lot because they have already done the research and as I've shown <laughs> earlier in this project if I try to uh, go off um, go off script and experiment I always end up not happy uh, so that's we're not going to do that um, but there are some strange bits when I when I looked up uh, kind of the the um, origin of the French hood and what makes a French hood. There are some bits that I can kind of recognize from the Tudor Taylor. So I thought I'd just mention them very quickly. And one of them is a crepe in. Uh, a crepe in seems to be a gathered or pleated silk or linen kind of. It's a head covering, a hood, cap sort of thing. Um, it's often worn without a coif, just straight onto the head, especially if it is linen made, I'm guessing, because otherwise you want some linen between your greasy hair and the fancy silk. Um, it might have been like a frilled headband and then like a bag to hide the hair in. Uh, you can kind of see that in early portraits of like early versions of French hoods. Um, I'm not going to have that, but the Tudor Taylor does include like a ruffle along the front of the paste so that's probably the the thing that's left of the crap in by the time you get to the french hoods of the 1530s and then i have also found people uh, or places that refer to something called the cornet or a bon grace or bon grace maybe i don't know or a shadow and that seems to be a sort of visor to shade your eyes from the sun but it looks really really strange um and i can't imagine why like a court lady would need sun shades <laughs> i don't know um i have seen portraits of people where the, the hood the veil in the back has been kind of flipped up onto the head and then kind of struts out over the head and that's referred to as a bon grace or a bon grace or a shadow so I don't know if that's kind of, if you're traveling in the sunlight and you want to protect your face or something, if that's the thing. Uh, I'm not going to include that, but maybe I'll feel funny and like flip my veil up over my head. I don't know. With the English hoods or the gable hoods, you see that quite often because they don't have one big veil. They have kind of two strips of veil and that one of them is pinned up on top of the head. Um, but you, it wouldn't do anything for the sunlight, like, let me tell you, it's just for show. So I don't know if it's, if it's the same with the French, I don't know. But I, what I do know is that I do not have any buckram. Uh, and I couldn't really find any without having to order it online and wait forever for it to arrive. But I do have some tarlatan. So I think I'm going to use that instead, just a double layer of tarlatan. Um, I have some wire, I have some scraps of silk, I have a ton of pearls and oaches, and I have a little bit of silk, uh, silk velvet. So, do you want to come along? And we'll make a French hood.
Thank you.